Chapter 4. Christ in You Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, if he is not born in thee, thy soul is all forlorn. John Johann Scheffler Man is a threefold being composed of spirit, soul, and body, so intermingled, so blended into one that is beyond the finite mind to say where one ends and the other begins. We read that when man was created, he was made in the image and likeness of God. No intelligent person can make the mistake of supposing that God has parts like the human body, or that the external man is in any way the image and likeness of God. God is spirit. God is life. God is love, wisdom, and power. God is a combination of all good. Can anyone tell me the active principles composing life? Can anyone analyze love for me? Can anyone weigh or measure wisdom? Can anyone catch and box up, see or handle spirit? Nay, verily, God is spirit, and the real man, made in his image, is spirit also. Spirit is substance. Substance, from the Latin sub, under, and stare, to stand, is that invisible, intangible, but real something which has its indestructible core and cause stands under, or at the center of, every visible thing. That there is but one substance of which all things visible and invisible are made is conceded by all scientists, whether spiritual or material. This one substance is spirit, forever invisible but indestructible. The words were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. God is not only the creative cause of every visible form of intelligence or life at its beginning, but at each moment of its existence. He lives within every created thing at its very center is life, the ever-renewing, recreating, upbuilding cause of it. This is not pantheism which declares that the visible universe, taken or conceived of as a whole, is God. No far from it, God expresses himself in visible ways. Man is his fullest, most complete expression. God is the living, warm, throbbing life that pervades our being. He is the quickening intelligence that keeps our minds balanced and steady throughout all the vicissitudes of life. He never is and never can be for a moment separated from his creation. We are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. 2 Corinthians 6.16 Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst not in the midst of the community at large, but in the midst of you individually. God is the father of our spirit, of our real self. We are his offspring, his children. There is one body and one spirit, one God and father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. God has made all his children alike. He has no favorites. The spirit of man always has been and always will be in his image while creation continues no matter what the external man does to hide that image. More than once, Jesus gave public recognition to the fact of our oneness with himself as sons of God, even as he is the Son, and joint heirs with him. Our Father, he prayed with thousands about him, Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God, said he to Mary. Call no one your Father on earth, for you have one Father, the one in heaven. The moment we recognize God as the Father of the spirits of men, and therefore the Father of all men, that moment we recognize a new and vital relationship of all men to one another, we say our Father with new depth and meaning. That moment we step out forever from all narrow, selfish loves, all me and mine, into the broad universal love that encompasses the whole world, exclaiming as did the Christ when looking around in the multitude, Here are my mother and my brothers. We are made in the image of God. Then is this eating, drinking, sensuous creature we see the image of God? No, not at all. But the divine spark at the center of our being, the ever-renewed breath of God, which is the life, the intelligence of this person, be it full or limited, is God's image, is very part of God himself. Is the ugly, rough piece of marble with only a nose or a mouth visible a statue? No, but it will be when the sculpture has finished with it. The perfect statue is there but hidden, awaiting the touch of the Master's hand to bring it forth. Jesus primarily taught men how to live, to repent of their sins, to turn from all wrongdoing, to love others even to the laying down of their lives for their enemies if necessary. Toward the last of his ministry he said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. 
for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Jesus had come to them as a visible Savior. He had shown them that he had power on earth to forgive sin, to heal the sick and raise the dead. He had called himself the life, the door, the way, but after it all, he said he had not told them all that he knew as yet. They could not bear it then. It is to your advantage, not mine, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Advocate to be with you forever, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. Thus Jesus recognized that a personal Savior to whom people could go outside of themselves was not enough. Such a scheme of salvation had its limitation. There must be an inner spiritual birth to each one, a consciousness of an indwelling Christ ever present within him, to be his guide and teacher when he, Jesus, was no longer visible. I will not leave you orphaned, he said to his disciples. I am coming to you. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. In all of Paul's early teaching, he spoke only of the Son of Man, Jesus, who had been crucified and was risen. But in later years, as he grew in grace and in the knowledge of the truth, he spoke to his spiritual children. I am again in the pain of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. He also spoke of the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What did Jesus mean? What did Paul mean? Is there then a higher, fuller birth than the one that many Christians know? that of the following, after the crucified Jesus, the Son of Mary, who is and ever must be a personality outside of ourselves. Surely there is. It is not easy to explain the relation that Jesus, the man of Galilee, bears to the Christ of God, who is to be formed in us, scarcely possible by words to explain the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It cannot be put into words. It comes to one as a revelation, and thus coming is as real as one's very existence. It was not the man Jesus, the personality, the Son of Man that was to be the Savior, for that part of Jesus was human. He spoke of it as such, I can of mine own mortal self do nothing. The Father who dwells in me does his work. The Son can do nothing on his own. It was the Christ, the Anointed, the very Divine at the center of his being who came forth and did the works through Jesus. The Comforter that he had promised was to be the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. The very Spirit of the same Father who abode in Jesus was to abide within them and us. This same Spirit, this Christ to whom is given all power, is formed by a spiritual birth at the center of your being and mine and abides there. He who is the image of the invisible God becomes the firstborn of all creation. That is, he is the first coming forth of the invisible Father into the visible creature. He abides within us, first as a babe, or in a small degree, but as he grows and increases in stature and proportion as we recognize him there. With encouragement and a sort of wooing, so to speak, we make room for the babe in the inn. There comes to be in the sweet and holy relation a living touch an intimate sort of interfering of our whole being with the divine source of all good and all giving. We become conscious of a new relationship between the living, indwelling Christ, unto whom is given all power, and the creature whose needs are unlimited. The very mind of Christ that was in Jesus is in you. You get to know that the infinite supply of soul, body, and circumstance is some way right at hand in this indwelling Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. From his fullness we have all received, and you have come to fullness in him. What a marvelous, almost incomprehensible relationship! How are we in our entirety, soul and body, to be made perfect? By striving in effort? By lopping off branches of the old tree here and there? By cutting off this habit and that habit? Not at all. None of these is the way laid down by Christ. He said, I am the way. He said, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one. We are perfected then by his perfect life, dwelling within the imperfect life and filling it with his own fullness. We are made perfect entire by this I in them coming forth into visibility, 
because of our waiting upon him in recognition of his indwelling presence and our continued affirmation that he does now manifest himself as the perfect one through us. He must increase, but I must decrease. End of chapter.